is what it sounds like when someone's life changes forever and their wildest dreams come true. Hello? Hello? Have you got your ticket in your hand? Yes, darling. You've won one million dollars. <laughs> Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And what about that for Feel Good TV? Yes, the media loves a winner, and commercial TV can't get enough of those good luck stories, perhaps because Tats Lotto is such a huge advertiser. Recently, Seven and Nine have been running them at the rate of almost one a week. Nine's a current affair got into a frenzy about instant scratches. Alma, look at this. You've got three twenty-five dollars. You won twenty-five dollars. <laughs> And Seven's Sunrise joined the hullabaloo over an instant lotto millionaire who had gone missing in Queensland. Matt Hart joins us now from Tats Lottos. Hi, Matt. So you know that this winner is oh, from good morning, Queensland. Guys. Uh, do you have any more information on who it is? Well, before long they did, because after getting the media to ramp it up all morning, Tats Lotto put out a bulletin to announce the errant winner had been found. It's just surreal. Young Can's mother wins $40 million in Oz Lotto. Wow, lucky mum. Not surprisingly, that was big news in Cairns, where the Cairns Post was on hand to report it faithfully. Or should we say, verbatim. After a day-long region-wide search for the unregistered winner of Tuesday night's entire $40 million Oz Lotto jackpot, a young mother from Cairns has discovered she has the winning ticket. That Lotto press release grabbed top slot on the Cairns Post website and was rebroadcast all around the country on news.com.au. So why would they bother to rewrite it? And why do it just once, if twice is also an option? Because the Cairns Post had already struck gold back in March when another lucky local had hit the jackpot. A Gordon Vale woman has been left stunned and shaking after a golden casket official this morning broke the happy news that she had won more than half a million dollars in a weekend Saturday gold lotto draw. Stunned and shaking. And so are we, because a quick dig reveals that Lotto's press releases are routinely copied all over Queensland, including by the Gold Coast Bulletin, the Sunshine Coast Daily, Rockhampton's Morning Bulletin, and a number of local radio websites. And a quick look at New South Wales shows it happens there too. So, what's the problem? Well, it's lazy for a start, and it promotes gambling. And while News Corp tells us it's not a sign of stretched resources, surely readers deserve better. But now to more sombre matters and the terrible London fire in which 79 people lost their lives. New pictures emerged last week of some of the burnt out apartments showing the devastation inside. And also of firemen heading to the blaze and seeing it for the first time. Well, it was towering in front, wasn't it? How is that possible? It's jumped up all the way along yeah, the flat, That was happening. And that is the question the whole of Britain is now asking. But luckily, News Corp's fire expert, Miranda Devine, already has the answer. Innocence burnt in the flames of green ideology. You can't overlook the deadly green ideas that contributed to the tragic Grenfell Tower fire in London. Yes, Miranda Devine reckons it was green ideology and deadly green ideas that caused at least 79 people to be burnt to a cinder and scores more to be scarred for life. It's hard to see how you could sink much lower than writing stuff like that. The next day in News Corp's Courier Mail, her fellow right-wing warrior Rowan Dean managed to do so, telling readers... The towering, deadly inferno in London is an extreme but apt metaphor for climate change alarmism and progressive politics. And adding... The coroner may as well scribble, cause of death, climate change alarmism, on his report. So, what was Dean's evidence for this extraordinary claim? Well, as he'd put it the previous day to a nodding Piers Ackerman on Sky's Outsiders, climate zealotry had to be to blame because... There's no other rational explanation for why this building went up like a tinderbox, like a Roman candle. Rowan, we're all... Well, actually, Rowan, a very simple explanation had already been offered. The cladding added to Grenfell Tower in recent renovations contained a plastic core, which was extremely flammable. And it's possible it wasn't installed correctly, which helped spread the fire rapidly up the outside of the building. As one lucky 17th floor resident who escaped the inferno told Channel 4... And I see the fire blazing and coming up really fast because of the cladding. The cladding was flat and flammable and it just caught up like a matchstick. For that very reason, according to several building experts and British government ministers, that particular cladding should not have been used on a multi-storey block. 
Well, again, my understanding is that the cladding in question, this flammable cladding, yes. which is banned in Europe and the US, is also banned here. Miranda Devine told her readers that this flammable cladding, which she and Dean both labelled green energy cladding, was added to Grenfell Tower... ..to achieve green ticks in the carbon-obsessed British regulatory system. But that is just plain wrong. As the planning application for renovations shows, the primary driver behind the refurbishment was to reduce excessive heat loss during the winter months. Or, put simply, to cut heating bills and keep people warm. But that's irrelevant anyway, because fireproof cladding was also available and could have done the job just as well. Grenfell Tower. Fire-resistant cladding is just £5,000 more expensive. Grenfell Tower refurbishers would have needed less than £5,000 to upgrade the building's external panels to a fire-resistant version. But don't let the facts or a few dead bodies get in the way of making cheap political points. And don't let's dwell on the other key reasons why people were trapped in the blaze. There was no fire alarms anywhere because we don't have a kind of integrated fire alarm system. It's just everyone's house for itself. Grenfell Tower also had no sprinklers, no smoke alarms and only one staircase. But Rowan Dean had another reason why climate zealots have blood on their hands. As he told Courier Mail readers... The fire appears to have been started by a fridge that exploded thanks to its environmentally friendly coolant. Again, this was something he and Ackerman had been kicking about on Outsiders the previous day. So it could be that the, the it could be we're not saying it could is. be that the initial explosion, explosion was, was caused by a green refrigerant. Well, it could be, even if they were quote not saying it is a weasel get out if ever I heard one. And back in 2009, Britain's Daily Mail and America's Fox News certainly claimed it was a problem. Alert over new wave of exploding fridges caused by environmentally friendly coolant. But that claim was hotly disputed at the time, and as even the Mail acknowledged, there are hundreds of millions of these fridges, and these incidents are very, very rare. What's more, in the Grenfell fire, while a fridge freezer did start the blaze, no one's yet suggested that green coolant was to blame. Indeed, the London Fire Brigade warned last year that there is... One fire a day in the capital involving white goods such as dishwashers, washing machines, tumble dryers, fridges and freezers. In 90% of cases, the cause was a fault in the appliance or its electrical supply. And yes, that includes electricity produced by coal. All in all, Dean, Devine and Ackerman have excelled themselves. For cheap, nasty, tasteless political shots, you really could not do much better. But now, let's come back home to New South Wales, where the Daily Mail has tracked down Melbourne's notorious Apex gang to Newcastle. Man single-handedly takes out three Sudanese men for starting trouble in a pub. The organisation who posted the shocking footage claims the men are members of the Apex gang. Yes, that Apex gang is everywhere. At least, it is in the tabloids. And it wasn't long before news.com.au was also hoeing into the story. Apex thugs knocked out in viral video. A video posted to social media purporting to show two men in a street fight with a group of Apex thugs has gone viral. And then before you could say break it up, the brawl was in a starring role on Channel 7's 6 o'clock news. There are safety fears in Newcastle after a brutal video emerged, reportedly showing two men being attacked by a gang outside a hotel at the weekend. So where had this brutal video come from, I hear you ask? This clip uploaded by far right-wing group Party for Freedom, claiming to show who they call a gang of Sudanese apex thugs, assaulting two men on Sunday morning. That's right, an impeccable source, the Party for Freedom website, which promises to make Australia great again with policies that include... Halt to Muslim and third world immigration to protect the survival of the Australian people. The Freedom Party's video was posted under the headline... Good night, Apex. Soon these thugs get decked. And that was good enough for the media to parrot the group's unlikely claims. Even though there was no proof they were gang members, and even though Chief Inspector Terry Burns of Newcastle Police was quick to tell MediaWatch... We have no knowledge of the Apex gang existing in Newcastle. In fact, the police had told that to the media too. So, why did the story still get published? Obviously because running 11 seconds of viral video that's racked up 1.3 million views proved far too tempting. And sprucing it up with the notion of a young black gang spreading fear made it that much better. News.com.au, The Daily Mail and Seven all knew there was no evidence for the Apex claim, 
but if they mentioned that, they slid it into the body of the story. There have been no reports of the Apex gang being in Newcastle, and there is no evidence that the men in the video are members of the gang, police say. It's a tried and tested formula, and one reason why trust in the media has fallen so low. And if you're wondering who started the punch-up, the police told the media it appeared the two Sudanese were the victims. But finally, to a lighter mood, and seven Sunday night, which last week flew halfway across the world to the Aegean Sea to drink from the Fountain of Youth. Ahead is the island of Ikaria, a place with so many people over the age of 100, they call it the Island of the Immortals. Ah, yes, a timeless tale that in recent years we've seen in The Guardian, The Australian, The New York Times, The BBC, and also on Sunday night's biggest rival, Nine's 60 Minutes. It's a Greek island called Ikaria, a magical place where people live longer than anyone else on the planet. Magical indeed. That was Liz Hayes on Nine's glossy current affairs show back in 2013, asking what everyone else in the media, including Sunday night, always asks. What is it about this place that means the inhabitants live longer and better than the rest of us? Answering Liz's question almost four years ago was American best-selling author and old age expert Dan Butner, who told her... None of these 90 or 100 year olds ever tried to live to be 100. Longevity happened to them. And looking a little bit older, Dan was there again last week telling Sunday night's Denham Hitchcock... If you notice the lifestyle of older people there, they're not just sitting around. They're not recipients of health care. But the similarities between the two broadcasts did not end there. On 60 Minutes, Liz Hayes talked to some locals. Thea Perikos was born and raised in America. And on Sunday night, Denham did too. Yes, that's Thea again. And naturally, both reporters were soon in the kitchen with their host, cooking what looks like the very same meal. If you want to cook, you have to have olive oil, oregano, garlic, lemon. These are the basics. They all contribute something, though, don't they? You have onion, you have pepper, zucchini. And after eating, of course, Liz couldn't resist the dance. And nor could denim. <laughs> I mean, really, is there no other way to tell the tale? And do we even need to hear the story again? But maybe Sunday night's just running out of ideas because its other story last week also looked familiar. Lawyer Rory Markham is representing more than a thousand ex-APCO workers in a class action against the company. How would you describe the conditions of APCO's workers? Uh, I'd say exploitative and cult-like. Hmm, I could swear I've seen that guy before. Uh, the culture appears very cult-like. Yeah, Rory Markham, the lawyer, was on the ABC back in February in 7.30's report on the charity marketers or chuggers at APCO. And Sunday night must have liked it because they used the same footage of bizarre bonding rituals and the same victims. The punishment for not getting $400 worth of sales in a day was to shove a cigarette up his bottom, and pull it out and then smoke it. So everyone hovered around as he was forced to shove a cigarette up his butt pull it out and smoke it. Not bad, eh? An entire program of reheated stories. But maybe it's time Sunday night cooked up some of its own. And you can read more about tonight's stories on our Facebook page or our website, where you can get a transcript, read statements from News Corp and download the program. You can also catch up with us on iView and contact me or MediaWatch on Twitter. And don't miss Media Bytes every Thursday on Facebook, Twitter and our website and also on iView. But for now, until next week, that's all from us. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.